A top story fugitive diamond merchant Mehul Choksi, one of India's most wanted in connection with the Punjab National Bank loan fraud case, has been captured from Dominica Island while trying to flee to Cuba. Now, uh, the 62-year-old had gone missing earlier this week from the Caribbean island nation of Antigua, where he fled in 2018. His disappearance came amid efforts to extradite him by the CBI and Enforcement Directorate, which are investigating the 14,000 crore fraud at India's second largest state-owned bank. Sources say Mehul Choksi had had reached Dominica, a tiny island nation in the Caribbean, by boat. But with a lookout circular issued against him, he was caught by the local police and is currently in their custody. The process of handing him over to the Antigua authorities is on and the CBI and ED have been informed. It would appear that he may have entered the island I illegally, possibly by boat. So the Dominican government is cooperating with the Antiguan and Indian governments. Uh, Mr. Choksi will be deported from Dominica. However, we have requested Prime Minister Skerritt and law enforcement in Dominica not to return him to Antigua, where he has legal and constitutional protection as a citizen. In fact, we have requested specifically that he be detained and to allow law enforcement in India to make the necessary arrangements with the Dominican government to have Mr. Choksi uh, returned directly to India. The fugitive and accused in the Punjab National Bank scam, Mehul Choksi, who went missing from Antigua from where he has taken refuge uh, two years back, has been captured in Antigua, the, uh, in uh, Dominica, the north of Dominica. That's what our sources in CBI and Enforcement Directorate have confirmed to us. In fact, there is a red notice against that has been opened against uh, Mehul Choksi and that's how our agencies were very confident saying that if he tries to flee Antigua or any other place, the moment he enters any immigration point, then they would be alerted. So they were very confident that Mehul Choksi, if he tries to flee uh, Antigua, he will be nabbed soon. So as per their confidence, now what we are seeing is that uh, Mehul Choksi would try to flee uh, Antigua and then reach Dominica through a boat. He was actually planning to go to uh, Cuba. That's what our sources have confirmed to us. But the Dominican police have arrested uh, uh, Mehul Choksi as of this moment. And what we are being told is that the process to hand him over to Antigua is currently underway. So very soon he will be brought back to Antiguan authorities. So what our agencies are saying is that this is uh, this will make the agency's case very stronger because Mehul Choksi has already filed a case uh, at the Antigua court seeking for a stay, seeking for a refuge there. But the Indian authorities are very confident through the ex Ministry of External Affairs and through the Indian Embassy there. They will be presenting their case there saying that Mehul Choksi is again a flight risk. He is again trying to escape the local law also. And that's so this will make the Indian case very stronger. And very soon this will help Mehul Choksi to be extradited to India. The Ministry of Home Affairs is likely to announce new guidelines for COVID as present one ends on the 31st of May. Now, towards the end of every month, the Union Ministry of Home Affairs issues fresh nationwide COVID directives or extends the existing ones till the end of the next month. In continuation with this, the MHA will most likely issue directives for June today. A top banker, Uday Kotak, has called for a change to the center's vaccine policy. In an exclusive interview to NDTV, he says the center must buy 75% of all vaccines and private platforms. The rest, the center should distribute equitably to states. What you make of what has happened to the, the vaccination drive, because the numbers you talked about in terms of the supply coming in, 6 to 8 crores a month, the fact is that the actual supply to the states, particularly in that 18 to 45 category, has crashed. Several states have actually had to close down their vaccination centers, which is why, as I mentioned, from vaccinating about 36 lakhs per day, 36 lakh doses a day, in the early part of April, we're now down to 16 lakhs, which is less than half. This is after the center said that we're liberalizing the policy, we're allowing states to buy directly from vaccine makers. Clearly, something has gone wrong. What, in your view, is that? I, I have a recommendation to make. You know, currently, the new policy requires three players, the center, the states, and the private sector. The quota for the center is 50%, and for the states and the private sector, it's not defined, and it's within the balance 50%. My personal view mm -hmm. is we should break it down to only two quotas. Center, 
75%, private sector 25%. And within the center's quota, the center must work towards an equitable distribution of the vaccine on a, a national basis across states. And that 75% pricing can be negotiated by the center with the manufacturer, whether it's a mix of 150 or 300, but whatever it is, fix one price and 75% right. going to the center who in turn distributes to the sales and 25% is free for private sector markets. And staying with the vaccine policies, the center's liberal vaccine policy actually a false promise. Now, on April 21st, the center had announced a new liberal vaccine policy where it said states can buy 50% stock directly from the vaccine makers for the 18 to 45 years category. Now, documents show that the center has fixed specific quotas for how much vaccine the Delhi government can directly purchase from manufacturers. Sanket explains. In January... There was a plan to vaccinate 30 crore people by July. That was the plan. 30 crore people will be vaccinated by July. Then in January, the government said that vaccinations have been planned only for the frontline and the elderly. In April 2021, vaccines, Covaxin and Covishield, these were the only two vaccines. Till April 2021, only two vaccine manufacturers were there. The Serum Institute of India and Bharat Biotech. Till April 2021, there was limited vaccine orders that were placed. No vaccine stockpiles had been created, right? So do you see where we have, we have faltered? We could have expedited this process. On the 1st of May 2021, the center allowed states to source vaccines. Then on the 1st of May 2021, again, vaccinations for 18 plus were also allowed. In this month of May, most states have reported vaccine shortages because the states are unable to organize more vaccine supplies from the global market because the whole concept of a global tender has been a big, giant flop. Let's now quickly take a look at the uh, top five states as far as uh, vaccination is concerned when you, take, uh, when you, when you uh, factor in the percentage of population of those states. So, as far as India is concerned, we have only considered, we have only uh, fulfilled about 4% of the population getting inoculated. This is the total percentage of the population fully vaccinated, fully, that means both doses. Gujarat is at 6.10%, Kerala at 6%, Uttarakhand at 6 Delhi at 5.8%, Andhra Pradesh at 4.30%. That's the vaccination rate, the best in these top five states. Now for the sad story, the lowest five states as far as inoculation is concerned on the basis of the percentage of the population fully vaccinated, Assam at 2%, Madhya Pradesh at 2%, Jharkhand at 2%, and for the bottom two, let's go full frame to that graphic, the state of Uttar Pradesh and the state of Bihar have inoculated fully only 1%, the most populous states of this country, only 1% of their population has been fully vaccinated. This is the vaccine truth as of this moment in this country. Now, there's a fair bit of double speak also as far as vaccines are concerned. Center's liberal vaccine policy, could that be a false alarm or a false promise? On the 21st of April, the centre announced a new liberal vaccine policy where the centre said that the states can buy 50% stock directly from vaccine makers uh, domestically. For the 18 to 45 category, on the 24th of May, the centre apparently did a U-turn informing the court that it is fixing quotas for how much states can buy directly. On the 17th of May, centre's letters to Delhi were perhaps uncovering this truth of a liberal scheme. How can you at one point say that we've opened this up from within the 50% you can go and procure directly and then you're also fixing the doses. So obviously we've faltered somewhere as far as our vaccination policy is concerned. 
Now, Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal has called on the center to urgently procure enough doses to inoculate people in the national capital and other states across the country, rather than leaving it to states to try and negotiate separate deals with manufacturers. जब दुनिया के दूसरे देश अपने अपने लोगों को बड़े स्तर पे वैक्सीन लगा रहे थे हम अपने लोगों की वैक्सीन लगाने की बजाय अपनी वैक्सीन दुनिया के दूसरे देशों को भेज रहे थे अगर अपने देश के लोगों को सही समय पे वैक्सीन लगा दी जाती तो शायद दूसरी वेव के प्रकोप को काफी कम किया जा सकता था कई लोगों की जान बचाई जा सकती थी उन वैक्सीन को छोड़ दीजिए जो केंद्र सरकार ने दिए हैं उन्हें छोड़ के कोई भी राज्य अपने प्रयासों से किसी भी कंपनी से एक भी एक्स्ट्रा टीके का इंतजाम नहीं कर पाया वैक्सीन कंपनियों ने साफ साफ कह दिया कि वे राज्य सरकारों से बात नहीं करेंगे केवल केंद्र सरकार से बात करेंगे and staying with news of vaccine shortages as in the rest of the country karnataka supply of covid vaccines is no in meeting its demand the state is trying to also source vaccines directly through a global tender and have had two responses so far pfizer and moderna have indicated they will not supply directly to states but only to the central government if and when any deal is worked out karnataka currently ranks 9th in terms of the percentage of population given at least one covid vaccine dose at 14% that's below the national average the state is looking to source two crore doses through a global tender two companies have responded to karnataka's tender both companies have talked about the supply of the sputnik vaccine and they have both asked for two extra days to provide technical and financial papers one company bulk mro industrial supply incorporated from mumbai for the regular two dose vaccine of sputnik and another company tulsi systems of bengaluru for sputnik light which would be available only by the end of the year a karnataka covid task force member describes the vaccine shortfall as colossal as the population uh, is demanding across for a vaccine there seems to be a colossal shortage of it and then i think one of the options is to open up all these global vaccine providers to come into india and and help at this juncture because otherwise it's going to be a long haul while new case numbers are coming down in the state largely due to the lockdown say experts the congress critical of the state's vaccine acquisition policy has been on the offensive the party has been asking for permission to procure 100 crores worth of vaccine but there is no clarity on where they would actually source these vaccines from the central government has to take up this initiative this is not the sister subject So you please allow us with our mp funds urgency is the key but the wait for sufficient vaccines continues with govindan kumar maya sharma in bengaluru for ndtv and staying with news of karnataka karnataka health minister dr k sudhakar said that the state will now have a new covid discharge policy and post covid precautions in view of the rising cases of black fungus infection or mucormycosis at the time of discharge now covid patients who've recovered will be tested for any fungal infection and will also be subjected to an mri scan if necessary All district hospitals have been instructed to have a dedicated post covid ward after one week of discharge recovered patients should get themselves tested at the hospital or can also opt for teleconsultation and if symptoms are found they will be called to hospitals for further diagnosis the health minister also said that it's been found that administering steroids in the first week of treatment for covid is one of the main causes of black fungus infection steroids should be prescribed only from the second week News now from Uttar Pradesh and in an incident that has that an officer has blamed on oversight a group of villagers were given mixed doses of covid vaccines at a government hospital around 20 villagers in the Siddharthnagar district uh, to 270 kilometers from Lucknow were given both covaxin and covishield officials claim no one has faced any adverse health effects and those responsible will be punished a cocktail of covid vaccines for this elderly couple and 18 other villagers in up siddharthnagar who were injected with covid shield in the first week of april and then given covaxin as their second dose in mid may the shocker took place at this primary health center in the largely rural district around 270 kilometers 
फ्रॉम स्टेट कैपिटल लखनऊ बीस लोगों को कोविशील्ड पहला डोज दिया गया बाद में उनको कोवैक्सीन लगा दिया गया तो ये चूक नहीं है सर ये चूक तो है क्योंकि गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया का अभी कोई मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ हेल्थ की कोई ऐसी गाइडलाइन नहीं है कि कॉकटेल लगे जिसके लिए हमने इंक्वायरी ऑर्डर की थी और उस रिपोर्ट के आधार पे जिन जिन दोषी लोगों को मैंने उनको स्पष्टीकरण उनसे मांगे हैं वाइल द इम्पैक्ट ऑफ मिक्सिंग वैक्सीन इज स्टिल दब्जेक्ट ऑफ ग्लोबल रिसर्च दिस ऑफिशियल हैनी एडवर्स इफेक्ट फ्रॉम दिस सो कॉल्ड ओवरसाइट But at least one of the villagers who received the mixed shots said no one from the health department had come to check on them. Bhai kin to wahan doctor ne bataya ki ye to galat ho gaya wahan lag gaya dusra suit. Koi nahi aaya koi karmachari nahi aaya na sarkari aaya na gair sarkari koi karmachari nahi aaya puchne ke liye. Last month three elderly women in western UP's Shamli district were given an anti rabies shot instead of the covid vaccine. The UP government acknowledged after a probe With Salman Amir and Siddharth Nagar and Vineet Verma this is Alok Pandey and DTV Now the first patient who got the new covid treatment uh, cocktail which was recently approved in India the monoclonal antibodies treatment at the Medanta hospital has been discharged an 82 year old was discharged from the hospital in 24 hours according to Dr Narish Trehan So that's why it has been tested extensively and used extensively in the United States and Europe and the experience shows that when given in time given in time means the first 7 days of the infection are what we call the viral replication stage or when the viral virus multiplies so by blocking it there you are reducing the severity of the disease in everybody but especially in those people who would have had a severe infection because of comorbidities along with their age and also a high viral load now as cases have dipped in maharashtra the government has banned home isolation for covid patients in 18 districts the maharashtra health minister has said people are not following norms at home but the big question is will no home isolation rule help reduce cases more patients in isolation centers fewer at homes That's what the Maharashtra government has told 18 districts in the state where positivity rate is above the state average. Home isolations ki sankhya kam honi chahiye balki na ke barabar rehni chahiye aur home isolations mein treatment theek nahi ho rahi hai isliye home isolation ke bajaye sabhi ko covid care center CCC mein dakhal kiya jaye. The 18 districts are Satara, Sindhudurg, Ratnagiri, Gadchiroli, Usmanabad, Bid, Raigad, Pune, Hingoli, Akola, Amravati, Kolhapur, Thane, Sangli, Vardha, Nashik, Latur and Ahmednagar. Gram panchayats can use 25% of the funds under the 15th Finance Commission to set up isolation wards in villages. Maharashtra currently has a positivity rate of 16%. In Ahmednagar, preparations have begun. The municipal corporation has a capacity of over 2000 beds and more private centers are gearing up. In two covid centers here we individually have the capacity of around 400 beds. In Ahmednagar district each and every taluka is starting covid care centers. So if the people don't go for home isolation and stay in covid care 100% this will help in reducing the corona patients. The state government has also directed officials in these 18 districts to increase testing but testing should not be generalized to increase the number and bring positivity rate down testing should be among high and low risk contacts of patients with sagar dusal in ahmednagar and sujit ambekar in satara purva chitness for ndtv The Indian Medical Association after protesting against the remarks of a Ramdev a yoga teacher has now sought legal action for his remarks questioning the efficacy of allopathy medicines IMA Uttarakhand has served a 1000 crore rupee defamation notice to Ramdev for his alleged remarks against allopathy and allopathic doctors demanding apology in 15 days failing which the IMA says it will demand a compensation of a 1000 crore from the yoga teacher For that time for us to slip into a short break more news on the other side stay with us
Welcome back. Now, WhatsApp has filed a lawsuit in the Delhi High Court against the central government's new digital rules that take effect. They took effect, in fact, from yesterday, uh, saying that these would compel it to break a privacy protection. WhatsApp said it has nearly 400 million users in India and wouldn't tracing chats break end-to-end -end encryption. In response to WhatsApp's legal challenge on grounds of user privacy, the government said it has committed to the right to privacy of citizens, but it's subject to reasonable restrictions and no fundamental right is absolute. The gloves appear to be finally off. The widely popular chat app WhatsApp has sued the Indian government, the first social media giant, to do so, arguing that the new IT rules, which come into force from today, could break its privacy protections. In its petition before the Delhi High Court, WhatsApp, which has over 400 million users in India, asked for declaring the rule to identify the first originator of the information as unconstitutional. In a statement, WhatsApp said, requiring messaging apps to trace chats is the equivalent of asking us to keep a fingerprint of every single message sent on WhatsApp. This would break into an encryption and fundamentally undermines people's right to privacy. We have consistently joined civil society and experts around the world in opposing requirements that would violate the privacy of our users. In the meantime, we will continue to engage with the government of India on practical solutions aimed at keeping people safe. WhatsApp has moved Delhi High Court challenging the intermediary guidelines, calling it to be unconstitutional. WhatsApp in its petition before the Delhi High Court pleads, the rule to identify the first originator of an information is against the fundamental right of right to privacy. The government of India responds to WhatsApp's petition and has said that the right to privacy is not absolute. The centre has further said that the traceability guidelines are a reasonable restriction and is not contrary to the right to privacy. Foolhardy to doubt the objective behind intermediary guidelines which aim to protect law and order. Taking the government to court is a major step for a social media giant like WhatsApp who have been often criticised for giving in to government overreach with an eye on India's blooming digital market. WhatsApp's petition comes at a time of rising tensions between social media firms and the Indian government. Just two days ago, Delhi police had visited the offices of Twitter after it had labelled tweets by BJP leaders as manipulated content. With Arvind Gunesekar, Akhilesh Sharma, Rubina Mungia for NDTV. Now, the government wrote to major social media platforms last night, yesterday evening, in fact, whether they had complied with the new digital rules taking effect and asked for their response ASAP, preferably today, is what the letter said. Platforms like Facebook, WhatsApp and Twitter were given three months to comply with the new rules. Well, with that, time for us to slip into a short break. More news updates on the other side. Stay with us. In an exclusive interview to NDTV, top banker Oday Kotak says the time has come for the centre to do cash transfers to the poor. He says this that the centre should spend between half to 1% of the GDP, around 1.2 1 or 2 lakh crores. He also says it's time for the RBI to print cash. If not now, when? I think the time has come now for us to consider a fiscal expansion to support the economy and this expansion needs to take two parts one is to the bottom of the pyramid where just as the government has been doing on food to expand on the food side and medical side simultaneously work programs strengthen further like narega and third even direct cash transfers to the poorest for meeting their day-to-day -day essentials and when it comes to an actual direct cash transfer, would you have some kind of amount or number in mind as to what I, would my be a suitable amount? We should be considering between half to 1% of GDP. GDP on a nominal basis of India is around 200 lakh crores. So I would say between 1 to 2 lakh crores. Do you think that, that we are or we should be able to afford this kind of spending? In my view, this is a time for us to be able to expand the balance sheet of the government duly supported by the RBI which mm. should deficit finance a part of the government's mm. expanded balance sheet rather than letting that go to the market borrowing 
which means the RBI's balance sheet will be expanded, what is known as monetary expansion or printing of money. Time has come for us to be doing some of that because right. unless we can protect growth through this period over the next one year, we run the challenge of trend growth rate getting more gradual on a long-term basis. Okay. That's significant, sir. You're saying even if it comes to having to print money, this is the time to do it. Absolutely. It's not now when. In other news now, not all mucormycosis or black fungus patients in Punjab are those who have recovered from COVID, according to health officials, out of 158 confirmed cases of the black fungus infection in the state till Tuesday afternoon, 32 had never developed COVID symptoms, even as the virus has emerged as the most common factor among the patients. Uh, similarly, out of 413 black fungus patients admitted in different hospitals of Haryana who were analyzed, 64 were never COVID positive, 79 were not diabetic, and 110 10 had not taken steroids and 213 were not on oxygen therapy. Many doctors believe there should be a study to find out the reason for uh, this increase in cases of black fungus. News now from Tamil Nadu and in Tamil Nadu, social distancing norms were violated as ration shops uh, as people defied the COVID appropriate behavior. Could this lead to a second surge in weeks to come? Sam Daniel reports. At least a few hundred people queue up without physical distancing for a few hours every day at ration shops like this one to buy essential commodities and collect the government's cash relief of 2,000 rupees per family. Lakshmi, a domestic help, has come in to collect free rice. She's been without work or pay for the third week. Many like Usha say they have no choice. The government has to take this responsibility. Yeah, because uh, the government put uh, separate volunteers for the separate stations. Uh, then only the people will crowd is clear. In the first wave, Chennai's Coimbedu market turned into a super spreader, infecting more than 6,000 people. Now, with the city's daily tallying just beginning to dip after crossing 7,500 two weeks ago, doctors are worried. It is important for us to be socially responsible enough to prevent the spread of the disease. We either swim together or sink together. Following NDTV's report, authorities sent in volunteers to regulate the crowd. But with uncertainty over lifting of lockdown, the government says ration shops can't be shut. However well intended, there's little public cooperation, even as Tamil Nadu's daily tally hovers around 34,000. Over the weekend, the state government had let the floodgates of shops and outstation travel open, and that had led to criticism. And now there's worry all these could lead to yet another spike in the weeks to come. In Chennai with Shah Vijay, Sam Daniel, Find the TV. It's been six months since the farmers' agitation began and protesting farmers observe, observed a black day on the 26th. However, given the COVID crisis, farmers decided against crowding at the Delhi borders, but they remained undeterred and say they will continue the agitation. Akshay Dongre reports. Breathing winter, summer, scorching sun. Police water cannons and tear gas. A tractor parade and violence and arrests after the farmers' agitation reached Red Fort. Six months after the anti-farm laws protests started and 11 rounds of talks with the government later, farmers are standing their ground. In this time, these farmers have also lost 400 of their colleagues to illness, COVID, cold and suicide. Anything. We are prepared for, for this agitation till the, the logical end. 
in the 11 meetings up to 22nd January, we have proved our case. We have proved that these laws are not uh, in the interest of the country, in the interest of the farm. The government has no, uh, no logic behind it, these laws. These six months have also seen a COVID surge in rural Haryana and the chief minister blames the farmers' agitation. और चाहे आजकल ये जो सड़कों पर बैठ के आंदोलन चलाने वाले लोग इनसे भी मैं निवेदन कल भी मैंने किया है कि ये सरकार के साथ लड़ाई आपकी हमारी चलती रहेगी एक बार इस कोरोना से मुक्त हो जाएं हम लोग आज ये समय क्योंकि उसमें से भी कोरोना आगे बढ़ रहा है फैलाव हो रहा है गांव गाँव में बुरी हालत हो रही है The agitation has also seen sharp political divides but it has continued largely without political support khela hove khela even though the farmers take credit for the bjp's loss in the west bengal polls as the talks between the central government and the farm union leader doesn't seem to be taking place in the near future the farmers are adamant that they will continue with their agitation till the time the farm laws are not repealed meanwhile a lot of states go to poll next year and it would be interesting to see that how the central government and the farm union leaders change their strategy keeping that in mind With Mohammad Ghazali in Chandigarh and camera person Sushil Rathi, I'm Akshay Dongre for NDTV. TV. A law which allows the authorities to recover compensation from violent protesters who cause damage to property has come into effect in Haryana. Haryana Home Minister Anil Vij said that the act was notified by the state government earlier this month. He said with the implementation of the act in the state any damage done to people's shops, houses, government offices and vehicles, buses and other property in disguise of um, any movement will be recovered from the protesters. The statement of Home Minister holds relevance since the state has seen frequent run-ins with the farm protesters. in the last 6 months ye waqt ki mang hai hindustan ek pratantrik desh hai isme har aadmi ko pradarshan karne ki ijazat hai lekin pradarshano ki aad mein kuch asamajik tatva desh ki pradesh ki logon ki sampattiyon ko nuksan pahunchate hain to ye qanoon banaya gaya hai ki yadi koi nuksan pahunchaye तो उससे उसकी वसूली की जा सके Now the government has written to major social media platforms yesterday evening on whether they had complied with the new digital rules taking effect on the day and asked for their response ASAP. A platforms like a Facebook, WhatsApp and Twitter were given 3 months to comply with the new rules that require them to appoint a compliance officer in India and set up a grievance response mechanism and take down content within 36 hours of any legal order. Here's what the co-founder and CEO of Ku said to NDTV. Joining us now a very special guest our premier Radha Krishnan the co-founder and CEO of Ku Ku many see to be the Indian Twitter good to sir good to speak to you uh, our premier it's a it's a big day for you uh, you have a smile on your face but are you a bit apprehensive because let's face it complying with these will be difficult it's not that easy for you is it Well, uh, when we went through the guidelines, uh, you know, when they were passed, uh, you know, we we found that you know it is necessary uh, to keep the users happy and reassure them of uh, the safety uh, for using uh, internet and social media, right? Like, you know, you you allow everybody to you know come onto the road and drive their cars and ride their bikes, uh, and there will always be rules that you will have to follow. that really what the problem is that within 36 hours as per the new rules you would need to enforce a take down is there any time left for someone to appeal appeal this uh, so we are a india registered company where indian citizens uh, you know all companies uh, whether it's media or otherwise have to you know comply with the law of the land so we will comply with the law of the land and if the person has uh, you know has a problem with the kind of uh, decision that has been taken by any authority uh, there are already places that they can go and uh, get a redressal for that separately right so it's not, it's not that you know who is taking a judgment but the but the point is that isn't i mean and the basis of this the basis of the argument is that the freedom of 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 expression the freedom of free speech could in fact be stifled if the government were to decide right that uh, the sovereignty of india is being threatened by certain posts and then in the recent past when the farmer protests were going on they felt that greater thunberg and others were compromising or affecting the potential sovereignty of india and you are told to take that down many would say that that's a bit extreme 
Yeah, so as a as a platform, uh, we are not the judge. We are not the court. We are not the elected representative. We are not the right body to take a judgment on whether to keep that or not. Okay. Right? Uh, we are a technology company which is enabling a stage, giving a mic. Right. What is being told? The country already like if you if you uh, book a hall, and you have an audience and you're speaking something. So we are the hall. We are the mic. Right. What is being said? If somebody gets offense, offended in an offline setup, they will go and complain to somebody, right? You know, the government comes to you and says, take this down, this is deemed to be illegal for whatever the reason may be. Um, but then if a private citizen is constantly abused on coup, um, in one which, any which way, as we know, that happens all the time, they can appeal to you and somehow you are not obliged to take that down in 36 hours or 72 hours or whatever it may, may be. So isn't that a bit of a mismatch? The common citizen I think, and his or her power versus the power of the yeah. government. No, I think building a, a healthy ecosystem in, the, uh, in India for social media use is, uh, has three pillars, right? Uh, there is the government, there is the user, and there is the platform. I think you know, it has to be a constant dialogue between all three parties and make sure that we are moving towards what is a safe ecosystem for the user. The user triumphs all the time. Um, one or two other questions. Firstly, the use of artificial intelligence or automated tools uh, to ensure that some of the worst content goes away. Child sexual abuse material, stuff depicting rape. This is the absolutely essential. It just has to go away instantly. Yes. Nobody should. Yes. It's illegal by any standard of humanity. Absolutely. But while that is so very important, isn't the, the worry which has been stated is that this could the, the function itself could creep into being used to take down other content which shouldn't be taken down. Not at all. Again, you know, we uh, even, even in the content that is uh, iffy, right? Uh, most of it is in black and white, right? You can take easy decisions. You can make machines learn to take those easy decisions, right? In certain cases, which are gray, uh, you know, we we also are constituting an advisory board, which will include uh, you know eminent people who will help us uh, navigate the gray, even if we don't get any request from anybody else to take it down, right? And there is uh, an elected representative uh, who is who is also looking at what is happening and what is not happening. One final question to you. You aren't worried about a scenario where you're inundated by requests from the government to pull down content? No, it's not happened so far. We're a small company. And uh, as I said, constant dialogue will always help. Uh, you know, we are always for the user. We're for freedom of speech. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the offenders don't spoil the experience for the 99% and more good users. All right. Uh, our Premier Radhakrishnan, co-founder and CEO of Co, great speaking to you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome. You're watching Good Morning India. I'm Gargi Rao. Our top story, fugitive diamond merchant Mehul Choksi, one of India's most wanted in connection with the Punjab National Bank loan fraud case, has been captured from Dominica while trying to flee to Cuba. The 62-year-old had gone missing earlier this week from the Caribbean island nation of Antigua, where he fled in 2018. His disappearance came amid efforts to extradite him by the CBI and Enforcement Directorate, which are investigating the 14,000 crore fraud at India's second largest state-owned bank. So say Mehul Choksi had reached Dominica, a tiny island nation in the Caribbean, by boat with a lookout circular issue issued against him. He was then caught by the local police and is currently in their custody. It would appear that he may have entered the island e illegally, possibly by boat. So the Dominican government is cooperating with the Antiguan and Indian governments. Uh, Mr. Choksi will be deported from Dominica. However, we have requested Prime Minister Skerritt and law enforcement in Dominica not to return him to Antigua, where he has legal and constitutional protection as a citizen. In fact, we have requested specifically that he be detained and to allow law enforcement in India to make the necessary arrangements with the Dominican government to have Mr. Choksi 
uh, returned directly to India. Well, let's go across to Nita now for more. So, Nita, that's a very interesting uh, development. Uh, on one hand, of course, the dramatic arrest uh, in Dominica of Mehul Choksi. But now, uh, the, uh, Antigua is saying they're not going to ask for his return to Antigua. In fact, ask Indian authorities to directly extradite him from the Dominic Island. Absolutely, Gargi. You know, it has legal connotations also and diplomatic connotations also. Legally, the case can, you know, again, be entangled with lot many international laws because India obviously does not have any extradition treaty with Dominica. As far as Antigua and Barbados were concerned, we had a extradition treaty with them. Uh, Mr. Choksi was facing two cases in Antigua. One was for extradition and one for one was for citizenship. Uh, the, the government was regularly in touch with them, the enforcement directory, the CBI had sent in their extradition request. But now, you know, the whole process is again going to start, it looks like, because uh, the Prime Minister there himself is saying that he would request the Prime Minister in uh, Dominica to, you know, send him directly to India. So, obviously, the legal battle will again, you know, go for a, a six, because India obviously does not have a very good history as far as extraditions requests are concerned. Till date, only 60 people have been extradited. And maximum number of people have been extradited from UAE. As far as US is concerned, only nine have been extradited so far. So obviously, it is going to take a interesting turn. And uh, you know, uh, even last year, Gargi in 2020, in fact, the Ministry of External Affairs had given a detailed reply in the Parliament of India, in which they had said that as of now, from 2015 onwards, 72 people have been, you know, booked. Uh, you know, are uh, are booked for considerable amount of proceeds of crime are involved in respective cases who are you know uh, who are settled abroad and as far as extraditions are concerned they, the MEA had said efforts are being made proactively for securing presence of these accused in the country by the way of issuance of LOC RSC, RSCN uh, extradition request but uh, you know still nothing has been materialized so obviously it's going to be a lo long haul but India could obviously make efforts diplomatic Automatically. We have got a new CBI director, Mr. Jaiswal, who has worked with RNW also and Intelligence Bureau also. So diplomatically, India can obviously make efforts, but legally, the case seems more entangled. I also spoke to his lawyer, Mr. Choksi's lawyer. Um, Vijay Agarwal, he said that he has been uh, detained, uh, he is in custody of CID in uh, Dominica, but he was uh, saying that he has to get in touch with the family before he comes out with a, you know, uh, with a formal statement. So he will get in touch with the family and then later in the day come out with a formal statement. Gargi? All right, Anita, thanks so much for joining us so with the latest developments there. So this may have further uh, entangled the entire process of extraditing uh, Mehul Choksi. Uh, thanks for that. In other news is the center's liberal vaccine policy actually a false promise. Now remember April 21st, the center had announced a new liberal vaccine policy where states could buy 50% of stock directly from the vaccine makers for the 18 years to 45 years category. But now documents with NDTV show the center fixed specific quotas for how much vaccine the Delhi government can directly purchase from manufacturers. Sanket explains. In January... There was a plan to vaccinate 30 crore people by July. That was the plan. 30 crore people will be vaccinated by July. Then in January, the government said that vaccinations have been planned only for the frontline and the elderly. In April 2021, vaccines, Covaxin and Covishield, these were the only two vaccines. Till April 2021, only two vaccine manufacturers were there. The Serum Institute of India and Bharat Biotech. Till April 2021, there was limited vaccine orders that were placed. No vaccine stockpiles had been created, right? So do you see where we have, we have faltered? We could have expedited this process. On the 1st of May 2021, the center allowed states to source vaccines. Then on the 1st of May 2021, again, vaccinations for 18 plus were also allowed. In this month of May, most states have reported vaccine shortages because the states are unable to organize more vaccine supplies from the global market because the whole concept of a global tender has been a big, giant flop. 
Let's now quickly take a look at the uh, top five states as far as uh, vaccination is concerned. When you take uh, when you when you uh, factor in the percentage of population of those states. So as far as India is concerned, we have only considered we have only uh, fulfilled about four percent of the population getting inoculated. This is the total percentage of the population fully vaccinated. Fully, that means both doses. Gujarat is at 6.10%, Kerala at 6%, Uttarakhand at 6 Delhi at 5.8%, Andhra Pradesh at 4.30%. That's the vaccination rate, the best in these top five states. Now for the sad story, the lowest five states as far as inoculation is concerned on the basis of the percentage of the population fully vaccinated Assam at 2%, Madhya Pradesh at 2%, Jharkhand at 2%. And for the bottom two, let's go full frame to that graphic. The state of Uttar Pradesh and the state of Bihar have inoculated fully only 1%, the most populous states of this country, only 1% of their population has been fully vaccinated. This is the vaccine truth as of this moment in this country. Now, there's a fair bit of double speak also as far as vaccines are concerned. Center's liberal vaccine policy, could that be a false alarm or a false promise? On the 21st of April, the center announced a new liberal vaccine policy where the center said that the states can buy 50% stock directly from vaccine makers uh, domestically. For the 18 to 45 category, on the 24th of May, the center apparently did a U-turn, informing the court that it is fixing quotas for how much states can buy directly. On the 17th of May, center's letters to Delhi were perhaps uncovering this truth of a liberal scheme. How can you at one point say that we've opened this up from within the 50% you can go and procure directly and then you're also fixing the doses. So obviously, we have faltered somewhere as far as our vaccination policy is concerned. Now, in an exclusive interview to NDTV, top banker Oday Kotak says the time has come for the centre to do cash transfers to the poor. He says uh, the centre should spend between uh, half to 1% of the GDP, around 1 to 2 lakh crores. Also says it's time for the RBI to print cash. If not now, when? I think the time has come now for us to consider a fiscal expansion to support the economy. And this expansion needs to take two parts. One is to the bottom of the pyramid, where just as the government has been doing on food, to expand on the food side and medical side. Simultaneously, work programs strengthen further like Narega. And third, even direct cash transfers to the poorest for meeting their day-to-day -day essentials. And when it comes to an actual direct cash transfer, would you have some kind of amount or number in mind as to what I, would my be a suitable is, amount? We should be considering between half to 1% of GDP. GDP on a nominal basis of India is around 200 lakh crores. So if I would say between 1 to 2 lakh crores. Do you think that, that we are or we should be able to afford this kind of spending? In my view, this is a time for us to be able to expand the balance sheet of the government, duly supported by the RBI, which mm. should deficit finance a part of the government's mm. expanded balance sheet, rather than letting that go to the market borrowing, which means the RBI's balance sheet will be expanded, what is known as monetary expansion or printing of money. Time has come for us to be doing some of that because right. unless we can protect growth through this period over the next one year, we run the challenge of trend growth rate getting more gradual on a long-term basis. Okay, that's significant, sir. You're saying even if it comes to having to print money, this is the time to do it. Absolutely. If not now, when? 
Health Minister Dr. K. Sudhakar has said the state will have a new COVID discharge policy and post-COVID precautions. This is in view of the rising cases of black fungus infection. At the time of discharge, COVID patients who have recovered will be tested for any fungal infection and will also be subject to an MRI scan if necessary. And all district hospitals have been instructed to do follow-ups. Well, let's go across to Maya uh, for more on this. And Maya, after a week of discharge, patients uh, will have to do a follow-up. Also, uh, the advice has been given not to give steroids in the first week of the infection? Well, mucomycosis outbreak in Karnataka, there are hundreds of cases reported and a member of the Karnataka State COVID task force, Dr. Vishalra, actually described it as an epidemic within a pandemic. As more and more cases are reported of mucomycosis or black fungus, it is of course found usually in association with high blood sugar or also uh, improper use of steroids, as well as lack of hygiene when it comes to administering oxygen to those who need it, whether the oxygen cylinders and other equipment are actually up to par when it comes to cleanliness. And so the state government has, in fact, announced there will be new regulations after discharge of patients. They will be checked before discharge to check for any cases of mucomycosis before they are actually discharged. Steroid use has been advised against in the first week of treatment for COVID patients. Maybe in the second week, steroid use should start. But since it is associated with improper steroid use, it has been advised that in the first week of treatment, COVID patients should not receive steroids. And also they will be checked for this before discharge. And district hospitals will actually have a follow-up ward, a follow-up ward where patients can actually come back for checking after a week to make sure that they're doing fine. And uh, they will, in fact, have an MRI, in fact, during discharge in case that's needed to make sure that they are free of this fungus, which has been causing trouble in the state and elsewhere in the country as well. Karnataka state numbers, new case numbers are falling. Of course, there is a lockdown still in place. But mucomycosis is really one of the new concerns in Karnataka, which has been one of the worst hit states in this second wave of the coronavirus and special steps being taken to try to combat mucomycosis. All right, Maya, thanks so much for joining us with those details. Well, to talk more about the COVID situation and uh, the cases of black fungus, we're now joined by Dr. Dinesh S. Avag, a senior consultant in chest and critical care medicine at Medicover Hospital, Nashik, a Dr. Nageshwaran, consultant, ENT surgery, a Minakshi Mission Hospital and Research Center, Madurai. Thank you so much, doctors, for joining us. Dr. Nageshwaran, I'd like to start with you. Your comments on what Karnataka has just announced in view of the rising cases of mucormycosis. They've said that they're going to check each patient before discharge from hospital uh, for any sort of fungal infection and then a week later also follow it up. Yes, the incidence of uh, mycormycosis is rising because of this COVID situation. Uh, mycormycosis is an infection which starts in the nose and spreads to other areas such as orbit, brain and also the cheek area. So it's uh, absolutely necessary to check all the post-COVID patients from, the, from discharging before discharging them to check for the evidence of fungus just by doing a diagnostic endoscopy or by examining the nose. Right, and is this something you, you, you know, you would uh, encourage other states also to follow, other doctors also to follow? Yes, it's better to involve, the, involve all the anti surgeons of this country to check the, all the COVID patients, particularly those who are using high steroids uh, to control the COVID, to better examine their nose before, they, before the patients are getting discharged. Right, uh, Dr. Ravag, now a lot has been spoken about uh, India's overuse of steroids, how a lot of doctors are overusing steroids, especially in, in the early uh, days of the infection and Karnataka announcing that, you know, steroids should only be given a week after uh, the infection is there. If you could explain to our viewers why this is so crucial. Uh, according to the FU guidelines, the steroids should be used only if the saturation level falls below 90, 90%. Right, Nine, Dr. Uh, Dinesh, I was actually asking Dr. Dinesh, uh, Dr. Dinesh, if you can. All right, I beg your pardon, uh, Dr. Yugal Kishore Mishra is uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Kishore, if you could just explain that, uh, I'm so sorry about that, if you could just explain this overuse of steroids. Right, so what had happens, because of the huge number of COVID patients, they had an availability of the beds in the hospitals, so the most of these people, they were doing their treatment at home. And by not knowing fully, understanding the proper treatment, a huge abstract, a lot of people started taking 
steroid in early phase, that is before the first week. And they continued unlimited, uncontrolled for a long time. This is one reason, that's why there's a huge, huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, infection of this COVID because of uncontrolled. And of course, the patient who had a comorbid like a diabetes, once you take a steroid, your blood sugar shoots up. That goes beyond your control, number one. Number two, the steroid itself is a, a, a you know, uh, this hampers the immunity. Hence, this uh, enhances the fungal growth. So these are the two reasons. That's why steroid is very important. One has to be very judiciously use this steroid and of course under uh, medical practitioner supervision. And we, we have seen in the second phase of pandemic, there was uncontrolled use of steroid in COVID patients. All right, uh, Dr. Dinesh is also with us. Uh, Dr. Dinesh, we were discussing how Karnataka has announced these new rules in terms of, you know, uh, checking patients uh, on discharge for any sort of fungal infection. They've also said that steroids shouldn't be used in the first week of the illness. Now, it's also important for people to understand steroids is one way of fighting coronavirus infection. It's just very important about when it's administered and how much, if you could explain that. A steroid is an important part of treatment of COVID. Definitely that has been internationally accepted and lots of papers are saying about it. Unfortunately, what is happening in India, basically many of the patients are getting treatment on OPD basis. That is one part which is getting more uh, involvement of unnecessary use of steroids. Many, many of the patients, actually the indication for steroid is patients who are on, who are on, uh, 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 on oxygen or patients who have CT scan findings which are uh, much uh, higher, those patients should be receiving steroids, especially in second wave. But uh, many patients, as they are receiving, uh, receiving treatment on OPD basis, and even from the uh, 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 general practitioners also, so that is a major part of uh, increasing the black fungus in, uh, in the patients uh, of post-COVID. One most important part is that uh, many of the patients, uh, this recent uh, viral strain, which is uh, supposed to be more uh, infective. And that's why we are getting uh, much number of higher patients around us. And uh, that's why we are uh, seeing these black fungus exponentially rising as compared to uh, the number of uh, denominators. That's right. Uh, Dr. Yugal Kishore, now in Delhi, at least, you know, the cases have come down significantly. The positivity rate has come down. But uh, just to remind everyone, and I'd like you to emphasize this, this is because we are right now under a lockdown. And uh, the real challenge is going to be uh, once the lockdown slowly starts opening, isn't it? Of course. And there is a role of COVID-appropriate behavior. And uh, once the lockdown slowly, slowly open up, one, one, uh, there is a reminder, as you said, to our delights that they must follow the appropriate COVID, uh, appropriate behavior. Mask must be there, maintain social distancing and, of course, uh, hygiene, oral hygiene and uh, hand sanitization. These are the must. If we have to continue for a long time, that there should not be any further resurgence and we can maintain this you know, the positivity rate below 5%, which is obviously very good at this stage, less than two. So Delight must do that because we are a very densely populated city here and we had a huge, huge issues uh, of, uh, you know, the second wave, unavailability of the hospital beds, ICU beds and oxygen. And now, now we are facing a, a mucormycosis courses where there is a really not availability of the drug, which is important in B. We are getting, uh, 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 you know, the very less supply as we needed. We need around 600 vial a day and we are not giving even 300 to 400. So that's the issue which uh, Delhi is facing. So if we have to remain complacent, then the issues may be resolved. All right, Dr. Nageshwana, if you could tell us about the situation there in Madurai uh, right now and, uh, and also about, uh, this, uh, about mucomycosis, what are the, one of the big challenges is that there's still a huge shortage of the medicine uh, to treat it, isn't it? And, and uh, you need a yeah. huge amount, you need quite a few doses of the medicine to properly treat even just one patient. Yes, yes. Frequently we are getting cases now and the cases are increasing day by day. And there is also a shortage of uh, essential drugs such as liposomal amphetamines in B. So it's a really tough situation for us to manage the case. So the even now, has to this be is continuing? This, this, these shortages are continuing, isn't it? Yes, yes. Shortages are continuing till, till, till today. Till today. 
So, how uh, have you been told by authorities? Are you expecting perhaps to get more doses organized? We do know the center asked yes, all yes. states to declare mucormycosis as an epidemic. Yes. So, uh, are you expecting the situation to get better? Yes, in the coming weeks, we are, I expect the situation to get better. Right now, we are right now we are managing with the drugs what we are having available, such as plain amphetamine. There is amphetamine deoxyfolate, which is more nephrotoxic uh, compared to the liposomal amphetamine. All right, uh, Dr. Dinesh, now since the numbers are coming down, you know, all you doctors and experts have had a moment to take a breath uh, given, uh, the, you know, it's not the same situation in our hospitals like it was a few weeks ago. Uh, what do you think the big learnings have been uh, after this second wave and, you know, how we need to ensure that we don't see yet another wave coming up? Yes, the most important part for this is obviously as uh, we uh, need to follow the COVID protocol or COVID etiquettes, uh, using mass social distancing, uh, th that is the important part of it. But definitely vaccine will play a major role. If you see the uh, uh, out of India and overall, overall worldwide data, uh, the majority of uh, uh, states, majority of countries are out of uh, this uh, second or third wave unless and until they have been adequately vaccinated. So vaccine will play a major role uh, in preventing the third wave. If we could be able to vaccinate the remaining people who are not been infected in, in a proper time, then maybe we will be able to avoid the major, major cases in third wave. Obviously, there will be uh, some amount of third wave, but the numbers will be decided by the number of people who are vaccinated uh, uh, earlier. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, doctors, for joining us. And vaccine shortage, however, remains a big challenge uh, in all the states right now, especially uh, for that age group of 18 uh, to 44. And hopefully that, too, is something that will get resolved uh, in the days and weeks to come. Thank you, doctors, for taking out your time and joining us on the channel thank this you. morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that time for us to slip into a short break, coming up on the other side, we'll take a look at the stock market. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, let's now take a look at the markets are opening. Let's bring up the Sensex there and the markets opening in the red down 85 points. Remember yesterday the markets were up and this was given uh, to be a you know, positive sentiment given that the COVID cases were coming down. But markets opening at 50,931. Uh, Nifty also in the red down 11 points uh, at 15,289. So let's take a look at the top gainers uh, this morning and uh, bringing up those numbers, Sensex top gainers. Uh, Tata Motors up by 1.93%, nearly 2% there. BPCL is up by 1.42% and UPL up by 1.32% at 823 well, let's take a look at the other, uh, now the top losers this morning. Uh, Hero Motor Corp, you can see, is down by 0.57%. Uh, Gale India is down as well, 0.56%. And Dr. Reddy's is down as well, uh, down by 0.51%. So let's take a look at the Nifty uh, 50 uh, top uh, gainers and Tata Motors is up by 2% there, uh, trading at 321. Uh, BPCL, they're trading at 478, up by 1.43%. And uh, Tech Mahindra is up as well at uh, 1021. And uh, the top losers on the Nifty are Asian Paints, uh, down by 1%. Indusin Bank is down by 0.97% and Maruti Suzuki in the red as well, uh, down 0.76% at 6,975. Well, let's take a look at the oil and gas stocks now and Gale India is down 0.43% at 151. ONGC also down by point, just around 0.18% there and Oil India is in the green uh, up by 0.04% so just marginally uh, up there. Let's bring up the auto stocks now and Tata Motors in the green as we said earlier up 2% 2.14 uh, to be exact. Maruti Suzuki and Mahindra and Mahindra both in the red uh, down uh, very marginally. Bringing up uh, the IT stocks and let's take a look, uh, Infibeam's Avenues is up by 1.24%, trading at 40.70. India Mart Intermesh is up as well by 0.19% and uh, Just Dial is up as well by 0.46%. Let's take a look now at the Realty stocks. 
and uh, Mahindra Life Space is in the green, uh, up very marginally by 0.03%. Oberoi Realty in the red, down 0.98%, about a percentage point. The DLF also in the red, down 0.50%. Let's bring up the infrastructure stocks now and uh, GMR Infra is in the red down 0.18 trading at 27.10. IRB Infra is in the green up by 88% there, 0.88% there. Uh, so the Sensex opening in the red down 74 uh, points there and Nifty also opening in the red. Well, that's uh, the stock markets on opening today. Thanks for watching. Time for us to slip into a short break. Welcome back. External Affairs um, Minister Dr. S.J. Shankar, who is in the United States, had an interview with uh, H.R. McMaster, or rather a conversation uh, where he spoke about the pandemic. He uh, talked about how India is hit by a domestic second wave, which has a higher caseload and fatalities. And he said at the end of the day, the takeaway is when you have a global problem, the only way out is global cooperation and mitigation. What do you see as, as the lessons from the struggle that we're still in the midst of? And, and, um, and what should the world know about India's experience? What more can other countries do to, to help uh, India and the world overcome and recover from COVID-19? Well, uh, you know, uh, HR, the way uh, things are in India right now, uh, we were hit by a very devastating second wave. Uh, and... Uh, uh, it's it's really uh, the the virulence of the uh, strains of the virus uh, this time were far more uh, than the first wave, uh, which is why you had a uh, you know a much uh, higher uh, case load as well as uh, much greater fatalities, unfortunately. But uh, uh, look, uh, at the end of the day, the the big takeaway, which is your question is uh, when you have a global uh, challenge, a global problem of, of this scale, uh, the, uh, the only way out uh, uh, is, is global cooperation, uh, global, global uh, mitigation in a way. Uh, so uh, uh, we've, we've, of course, uh, been dealing with this challenge, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the hospitalization issues, the oxygen issues, the, uh, the beds issues. And, and these are things which America knows well because, you know, you went through it uh, uh, as well last year, including in the city uh, where I am in uh, New York. Uh, so, uh, you know, so when, when people look at the, at the television screens uh, and see what's happening in some foreign country, uh, I think there needs to be that realization that uh, this could easily happen to us. In many cases, it has happened to us. Uh, and uh, the right response is, therefore, to, to help each other out. And I, I'm glad to say we have seen a, a tremendous outpouring uh, of international uh, support and solidarity uh, at this time. But, you know, one, one is the, the, the public health, the... the, the uh, humanitarian uh, immediate medical response, if you would. But I think there are larger uh, issues for, for, for the world order, for, for global politics in a way. Uh, today, clearly, we all need to think very much more about health security. Uh, I would argue that our sense of national security has actually uh, widened as a consequence of the pandemic. Uh, you know, we, we today... Uh, whether it is medicines, whether it's vaccines, whether it's even, uh, you know, last year it was masks and PPEs. Uh, in, in some countries, uh, I would say even food, because the supply chains, when they were diverted, has, has made people anxious. The second is, uh, uh, I hear this term strategic autonomy increasingly, this time from the West, uh, in Europe, for example, which is, you know, that for essential things, we need to be self-sufficient or we need to de-risk uh, our exposure, uh, that we shouldn't be over-dependent on single geographies or, uh, or one set of supply chains. So I, I think the, the post-pandemic conversations, in fact, even as the pandemic is going on, the conversations are beginning to change towards more resilience, 
more reliability, how do you de-risk uh, the world. Uh, and uh, uh, to my mind, uh, uh, it, it really makes an argument for what I would call decentralized globalization, uh, that you have different centers of production, uh, you have uh, uh, the, the assurance that if something, God forbid, goes wrong somewhere, uh, the world will not then um, be, be so completely threatened uh, uh, as the way we have seen uh, really in the last uh, year, year and a half. Uh, there are, of course, in addition, digital lessons, but you know that's, that's a whole subject uh, in itself. Uh, and the one chapter, I think, on the uh, Mahabharata uh, was was very very interesting as well. Where you use you use one of the two ancient or you know, uh, Sanskrit epics of, of ancient India as a metaphor, really, for India's approach to the world. So I know it's tough to condense, you know, into a to a short answer in an interview. But could you explain this theme to 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 our audience? How does India's past shape India's leaders' view of India's role in the world? Well. Uh, look, uh, my central thesis is that uh, India is a, a deeply pluralistic society uh, and uh, has, a, uh, has a very open, very positive view towards engaging the world uh, and that it must do so uh, by, uh, by really, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, falling back on its uh, traditions and history and culture uh, so that people uh, intuitively understand the challenges of today. Uh, and the reason I picked the epic is, you know, most, most Indians are very conversant with the epic. So the method, you know, it's, it's like uh, asking somebody in the, in the Western world, uh, if you give them analogies, I mean, you speak of the Trojan horse, uh, now, uh, people know exactly, uh, you know, what, what uh, or if you say the side, you know, a siren, a siren song. I mean, they, they know what you're talking about. Uh, so, uh, the, the, uh, to a large extent, I think uh, there are changes, you know, there are uh, uh, conversational changes in India because there are changes going on in India. Uh, and uh, it's important for people to understand that these changes can be a source of uh, strength or better understanding uh, of what is happening in the world. We are, uh, you know, as a deeply pluralistic society, we are intuitively a very uh, international society. Uh, that, you know, this term, the world is a family, is very deeply embedded uh, in, in uh, Indian thinking. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of the challenges of today, the, you know, the interplay of powers that uh, their relationship, the interdependence, the constraints on power. Uh, uh, for me, an important question, ethics. You know, how much does ethics, uh, does ethics matter at all? And if so, uh, what is the role of ethics? I mean, uh, you, you would perhaps in today's world talk about branding and reputational and soft power. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, ethics is, is at the heart, heart of uh, that. Uh, so it's an attempt really to use these analogies to uh, both uh, make Indians understand the world as well as the world understand that there are great traditions of statecraft and diplomacy. And uh, I would say almost, uh, you can say, uh, uh, multipolar uh, politics in India, uh, which, is, which is very, very appropriate for this day and age. I wonder if you might talk about, about your vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific, and then maybe also talk about this crisis that we feel in dem democratic nations these days, right? There's, there are doubts, uh, I think, in, across the free world uh, about the effectiveness of democratic processes and, and institutions. Well, uh, look, uh, let me start with the last observation. I don't know if there are doubts in other parts of the world. I want to tell you very bluntly, there are no doubts in India. I mean, we Indians are extremely confident about our democracy. Uh, we we uh, believe that uh, that's really the the uh, the political system uh, uh, and the value system that uh, suits us. That's because, as I said, uh, it captures our our fundamental diversity and uh, the uh, the uh, culture of really 
reasoning and and coming coming to positions and an acceptance of you know uh, what what the uh, rules of the day uh, through up so uh, over the last uh, 75 years i think we've held multiple elections uh, we had peaceful transition of power uh, there are uh, you know elections at different levels uh, one test of which is of course that uh, if you have changes uh, in the in the party uh, in power at different levels that itself is proof that democracy is working and i don't think anybody in india would trade democracy for an alternative uh, form of governance uh, so uh, it has its challenges it has its complexities the world's changed the united states has changed the number of players have changed the seamlessness of these two oceans is evident uh, whether it's politics whether it's economics whether it's trade uh, so now the question is if uh, once you accept there is an indo pacific and there are multiple interests at work in determining the character of indo pacific uh, the it is very obvious that indo pacific is central really uh, to the prospects of the world to the welfare of the world uh, free and open indo pacific is very much a uh, part of doing global good would you would you talk about really how you view the threat from from really the chinese communist party's policies you know different countries have different challenges sometimes uh, uh, in international relations it's very common for countries to cooperate uh, in uh, you know in wherever their interests converge uh, you 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 know it would not be for the first time nor the last time uh, that's another way of looking at it uh, obviously all of us have uh, values and beliefs and we discussed some of them uh, before uh, and uh, the basic thing about values and beliefs is they are values and beliefs precisely because you you think that's the right way to go uh, i am right now in the city where the united nations has its headquarters uh, so and the united nations has this you know as the centerpiece of uh, of the world order uh, does represent uh, a shared desire uh, to to promote global cooperation so i i think it's important for countries who who uh think similarly on key issues of the day who find uh, that their interests converge but to find ways of working together and i think that's really what's happened in the case of the quad the world's not going to be the same after the covid whenever that after is uh it's not going to be the same because uh we are as i said uh all of us in different ways are going to worry about uh our international exposure uh historically you know when times are good you tend to see international relations as endless opportunities uh sort of waiting to be exploited uh, okay the key question the number one question on everybody's mind today is covid uh, and uh the uh the worry which people have and i've heard this expressed by many countries Uh, you know do do we have accessible affordable uh, you know vaccines now we can't have a world which is part vaccinated and part neglected because that world is not going to be safe uh, so how do we you know get through uh, the global challenges in a in a global way i i think that's the big question minister i wonder if you'd share your thoughts on the trajectory of pakistan there's been of course a lot of press coverage about uh about talks now with the the pakistanis uh this is of course of course been uh, and and it remains one of the most dangerous flashpoints i think uh in the world uh is is really pakistan's hostility uh toward india the use of jihadist terrorist organizations against india as an arm of their foreign policy and of course uh both your country and pakistan being nuclear armed countries it it is one of the most dangerous flashpoints in the world w- what do you see as the future uh, of india pakistan relations and uh and and what what's your prediction on these latest talks and does this represent any kind of uh, uh a- any kind of hope uh for a reduction in tension and hostility between your two countries well look uh what i can tell you at this point of time is that uh we had a, a agreement some weeks ago uh between our director general of military operation uh that uh, we would not uh, uh fire across uh 
uh, at each other uh, across the line of control, uh, uh, which which has seen a lot of that. Uh, and it's seen a lot of that mainly because there's been infiltration uh, from from their side. So uh, so uh, the the basis for not firing is very clear because the reason for firing is infiltration. So if there is no infiltration, there's obviously no reason to to fire. Uh, that's a good step. Uh, but I I think there is there are obviously bigger issues. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know. Uh, uh, the two neighbors uh, have to find ways. It's not, you know, it's not a question of do we live with each other. I, I think so. At the, uh, uh, you won't live with each other if you're agnostic about how you live with each other. Okay. Uh, and you yourself pointed out that from 47, part of the problem has been the use of uh, cross-border uh, terrorism. Uh, so, uh, there also has to be uh, perhaps a, a appreciation of what the cost has been to themselves, you know, uh, what it has done to their own uh, society and uh, uh, how, how uh, you know, uh, that has uh, impacted them. I mean, they need to reflect on it because they are doing it uh, to themselves. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think it's important right now for uh, if, if uh, uh, there is thinking along the lines that there needs to be a better relationship with India. On our side, there's been clarity of thinking. And the clarity of thinking is that we cannot accept that risk. We cannot accept that it is in any way legitimate uh, as, as, as diplomacy or as any other uh, aspect of uh, statecraft. So let us see, you know, where, where, where uh, this progresses. Obviously, everybody hopes for the best. Minister, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about how you see uh, political developments in your own country. I know you're not a partisan person. You've served with great distinction across many, uh, against, across many administrations. Uh, but there is there's concern these days in the midst of the pandemic about some of these uh, Hindutva uh, policies uh, that could be undermining the secular nature of Indian democracy. And, of course, this is what terrorists love, right? This is what Jihadist terrorists love is they want to divide people and portray themselves as patrons and protectors of, of a beleaguered community or a community that believes that it is beleaguered. Uh, how do you see internal Indian politics evolving you know, really during this trauma of a pandemic and the recession associated with it? Uh, and, and, and are India's friends right to be concerned about some of these recent trends? Look, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, let me let me clarify uh, something. Yes, uh, I served uh, multiple uh, administrations, as you would call it, uh, uh, over a number of years when I was a, a civil servant, when I was a professional diplomat. I am today uh, an elected member of parliament of a political party, the ruling political party, BJP. Uh, so uh, do I have a political viewpoint and political interest? Of course I do. Uh, and I am uh, hopefully articulate and expressive uh, about uh, uh, the, the interests uh, that I represent. Now, uh, in terms of, look, what you said, uh, I'd, I'd give you the straight political answer and perhaps a slightly more uh, nuanced uh, uh, societal answer. The political answer is that uh, in the past there was a great reliance on you know what's called vote bank politics, uh, which is appealing to uh, to vote banks on the basis of uh, their identity or their beliefs or uh, whatever it is. And the fact that we have departed from it uh, uh, has been uh, obviously uh, a difference. Now, uh, India is a country of many faiths. We define, and, and faiths everywhere in the world are uh, very uh, uh, closely tied to culture and uh, identity. Now, in, in uh, our society, uh, we define secularism as equal respect for all faiths. Okay, secularism doesn't mean that you are in denial of your own faith or anybody else's faith for that matter. I think what you are seeing in India in many ways uh, 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 is the 
is the, uh, I would say, deepening of democracy, if you would call it, a much broader representation uh, in, in politics and in leadership positions uh, and in civil society of, uh, uh, of people, of people who are much more confident about their culture, about their uh, language, about their beliefs. Uh, uh, it is, and, and I would, I would uh, uh, be very open about it. I mean, these are people who perhaps uh, are less, uh, uh, shall I say, less from the English-speaking world, uh, less connected to other global centers. Uh, so there is a difference. Uh, and uh, I, I think sometimes that difference uh, is judged politically uh, uh, harshly. Uh, and it is often used uh, to, to create a certain narrative. Uh, the, the larger societal explanation I would give you, which is at the end of the day, you know, we have, you, you, you've been to India, okay? I mean, we are diverse in every conceivable sense of the term. I mean, ethnicity, language, I mean, you name a parameter and, and you know, it's, it's a broad spectrum uh, sort of uh, uh, representation out there. But when it comes to, to any, uh, uh, I would say, uh, policy or... Uh, uh, application of that. And, and I'll give you an example. I mean, we are going through a very stressful time uh, right now because of the pandemic. Okay. Uh, we are actually uh, giving uh, free food uh, uh, last year for multiple months right now, again, because of second wave we resumed to as much as 800 million people. Okay. Uh, uh, we put money into the bank accounts of 400 million people. Okay. This is what this government did. Now, if you are, uh, you know, feeding more than two and a half times the population of the United States, and you are funding more than the population of the United States, and you are doing this, I mean, pretty much anonymously and impersonally in the sense beyond the name and the detail, the bank account of the person, you're not asking anything more. There's no, uh, there's no criteria of uh, discrimination. So, uh, I think when you come down to real governance uh, judgments, uh, you find that there is a difference between the, uh, the political imagery that has been concocted and actually the governance uh, uh, record uh, out there. So I think uh, you should take it for what it is, uh, which is really politics at play. You can agree with it. You can disagree with it. But I would certainly uh, see that very much as part of uh, a political effort uh, to uh, uh, depict our current government uh, in in a in a certain way, and obviously, uh, I have a very profound difference with that. <laughs>